Welcome to Censored. I'm Aoife Vrednach. This episode is about a novel by Mae West called She Done Him Wrong. I know you're thinking, a novel? This season is supposed to be about memoir. But hear me out. Formally, this might be a novel, but the author is a bona fide celebrity whose career is built on this carefully crafted persona. She created some of the most quoted lines in the 20th century, like you've seen them on the tote bags and the mugs. And one of the ones that I enjoy is, it's not the men in my life, it's the life in my men. She spoke these zingers with her trademark nasal voice, her hand in her hip, and a dangerous glimmer in her eye. Mae West was a curated personality, and I think this novel can be profitably read through an autobiographical framework. To help me in this endeavour, I've asked an old friend back to the podcast. Dr. Murrin O'Kaneda of NUI Galway was previously on talking to me in Season 3 about Pamela Moore's Chocolates for Breakfast. Luckily, she's agreed to join me again because she has a thing for Mae West. Hi, Murrin. Hi, Eva. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for coming back. I know we're going to do our best here with Mae West, the the queen of the one-liner. I think we shouldn't even attempt her level of of, uh, one-liners, but we can at least pay tribute to them. Yeah, we won't. You couldn't compete with her. We'll just read out the best ones. (laughs) That seems the (laughs) easiest option. (laughs) So to start off, I was thinking about a drink that would go with the book. And... Although it's set in a boozy joint and there's lots of other people drinking, Diamond Lil, the main character, doesn't really seem to drink a lot. Like, I expected her to be quaffing buckets of champagne, but she doesn't really. However, I'm going to choose champagne because it goes with her fabulous outfits and her sparkly jewellery, and it seems the festive sort of drink that she would appreciate. What about you? What would you choose? Well, it seems that Lil basically gets intoxicated only on a mixture of diamonds and sex. And since neither of those are within immediate reach of me, I think I would also have to go for champagne. Though it is interesting that the book sort of places uh, alcohol as it's having its own sort of class class limitation. She points out that, um, you know, that downtown virtue was only extolled and sentimental song when the night grew grey and tears came easily to fall saltily among the beer slops. And uptown, vice was toyed with it in a dandified way, a toothsome concomitant of lobster a la Newburgh and champagne. That's on page 12 of the Virago, and I think it's a lovely uh, division of alcohol in all parts of society, but all about the vice either way. Yes, she is quite attentive to those uh, social mores throughout. And I suppose then, apart from the, you know, overall drink scheme of things, I want to move on to why the Irish censors would have banned it. And I do think that in a general sense, it was probably Mae West was the reason they banned it. I know that's not under the Act, there's no Mae West clause, but I feel that because her personality is so imprinted upon this, it is so associated with her and she is so ridiculously famous. I mean, this is a version of a play that she performed in New York in 1928, and then she created a film script called She Done Him Wrong, and that's released just before this book is released. So she is like a pin-up star, and I think that really it's her sexual persona that she creates on the film that leads the Irish censor to interpret this as just essentially indecent. And I think that's because of the relationship between Diamond Lil, the character in the film and in the novel, and Mae West, the creator or author. Do you think that there are strong resemblances between the two um, that in the novel? Do you think I'm talking out of my arse here, basically? Not at all. I think you're absolutely right. I think there are very strong resemblances, and not just in the sort of standard way in which we might, you know, also read a novel autobiographically. It seems to me that much of what West is constructing the not, not Diamond Lil through is exactly her own stage persona, as you say, and the and the, and the upcoming film persona. You know, the creation of Mae West herself. I wasn't at all surprised. At other times, listening to censored, I've been faintly surprised at some of the books selected. Uh, 
I wasn't surprised at this one being censored. There's plenty of decadent material in it anyway. But like you, I sort of figured that the very presence of Mae West as a kind of iconic figure of, of decadence and dissolution. This is, after all, a woman who was jailed for 10 days in 1927 for corrupting the morals of youth. Um, so I think there's no question but that uh, that would have been enough for the Irish censors. Um, and I think very much that Diamond Lil is herself very much sort of a, a Mae West's attempt to kind of render in the more permanent form of the novel a version of her own creation persona. Um, a luxuriant sex appeal, a hypnotic effect. Um, the only thing I'd say is that Lil, while cunning and sweet smart, and we may talk about aspects of her cleverness at various points, is I think not fundamentally as smart as Mae West, a woman who exercised considerable creative control over the, her own productions and her own production of herself. Absolutely. I mean, the fact that we're talking about three iterations of Diamond Lil on the stage in a film script that she wrote and then starred in, and then this novel. I mean, she has tremendous grasp over her persona as a celebrity and how she likes to portray herself, which is no mean feat up against, you know, the hard-nosed men of Hollywood. <laughs> Jill Watts, uh, one of her Mae West's biographers, uh, discussing her stage performance of Diamond Lil, describes her as bigger than life and notes that she added height with impossibly high-heeled shoes and wore a standard corset upside down with the top cut off, so to create this sort of extraordinarily exaggerated effect. So we can see Diamond Lil, for that matter, as um, a West sort of construction of her own persona was uh, very influenced by uh, earlier drag acts, and of course could be written on this and with her and on her role as both a supporter and a sometimes critic of homosexuality. Um, so we can also see, in a sense, Diamond Lil as herself a sort of larger than life version in the novel of the persona that may, the larger than life persona that Mae West has already created for herself, a kind of form of drag act in all senses of the term. Yeah, absolutely. I do find that argument very compelling because she is so exaggerated and crafted in the way that she presents her femininity in a really theatrical and flamboyant way that I can really see how that works. And turning a corset upside down. <laughs> That is mental. How did she get that idea? But other than the May Westness of the book, I suppose we should, you know, pretend like the censors actually read it and thought about whether they should ban it or not. I, th I will. I will say, Sai, that I, I've, I've no doubt the censors read it and got very, very steamed up about it. Uh -huh. Carry on. <laughs> Yes, yet they read it in the name of research. But I was thinking that it, they wouldn't really have gotten far. It's page four when we meet Diamond Lil, the main character, i.e. Mae West, and she's lying in a ludicrous and sensual bed that's in the shape of a golden swan, believe it or not. She's in what's, no, what's called her boudoir, because, of course, bedrooms are just beneath a woman like this. And I'm just going to quote this bit. The swan bed had come from France, and Lil liked to consider the possible accomplishments of all the fair lights of love who had undulated their bodies in becoming emotions in perhaps the very spot on which she now reclined. What? Hmm? Right, hmm? okay, so you're lying in bed thinking, I wonder who else shagged here, and how good was it, and what did they look like? <laughs> and my favourite part, actually, that is so good, but it's the wonderful trick about how she puts in becoming emotions instead of becoming motions, which is kind of how I read it first. And then as I was looking again, I thought, hang on, she's got plausible deniability there. She's she's put in emotion. <laughs> so I just think it's masterful. So do you have a favourite Mae West moment of filth? Oh, there are several, I'm pleased to report. But one that strikes me in chapter two at this point um, is a point where there's a description, not of a, a mother, not of Diamond Lil herself, but of a painting of Diamond Lil, which is on display in this uh, insalubrious uh, joint. And the subject of the painting was none other than the alabaster and gold Lil reclining in all her voluptuous nudity upon a background of purple velvet. No masculine eye could travel from the crown of that spun gold head 
past those vermilion-tipped peaks of breasts, down to those curling rose-petal toes, without being conscious of a physical change. That's there on page 14, and it's a remarkable moment. Um, again, there's a kind of playfulness here. This isn't even the figure of the body. The bo she isn't describing the body of her female protagonist here. She's describing a representation of it in the form of the painting. And in the guise, that gives again a sort of, if not quite a deniability, a, le a level of distancing. And yet it's this remarkable moment of this moment of kind of the lower class male gaze, all gazing um, upon a painting that's been made uh, so that um, her protector and her owner, Gus Jordan, want wanted to tell the world that Lil was his own a special property. And confusingly, in a way, this is his way of demonstrating his ownership of Lil. And in fact, this painting is then becoming, as sort of we're told, a commodity, a model for illustrators. Her picture was soon to be seen on new calendars, and already it appeared on the band of a high-priced cigar. So we have this kind of fascinating moment where Lil is being produced and reproduced and owned and turned into commodity. But it's also very much a painting that she's, um, that, that, that she's made happen, that she's sort of very aware of her own self-presentation. And I love the way that this passage allows for a kind of in essence, a kind of detailed, quite sensuous description of the masculine eye going down from the crown of the head to the breasts. And then, of course, there's a strategic uh, jump, shall we say, to the curling rose petal toes. And of course, the pa paragraph ends with, in essence, people looking at it, presumably having something very close to an erection. It's just that whole idea that she has made herself in the narrative into a pinup that she has created this soft porn uh, version of herself it's yes it's very funny and of course in the film it just very briefly I thought that was hilarious that they did include that there is an image of a naked woman put up on the wall in the film set but they conceal it by all the men standing in front of it so you get to see the backs <laughs> of their heads <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's so funny, the ways in which she plays with nudity and censorship and, you know, the wink, wink, nudge, nudge kind of school of uh, sexuality. Though despite all these remarkable ones, and there's several more passages, uh, West particularly enjoys describing Lil's walk, her wonderfully voluptuous walk. And of course, that's one of the things uh, she was famous for. But in some ways, if I, I agree with you that the swan bed would itself would have done it on page four. But uh, I think perhaps an even more disturbing passage from the point of view of the censor might come on page five, where she's say, thinking, um, to, put it, to put it frankly, Diamond Lil was a beautiful short course to hell. She was a chiripitous in a modern setting of white ice, a feeder on men's souls with diamonds for dessert. And then the, pa the passage shifts into her perspective. It was nice to lie in a gold swan bed. It was nicer still to have somebody give you diamonds. Men would wither and custom stale them, but diamonds, ah, they were crystallized immortality. And there's that naughty little tweaking of uh, Shakespeare and Cleopatra, in this case applied to the withering away of men, and the idea of this woman lying in her wicked bed, luxurating over her the true sensuous appeal of diamonds in its own way, might be just as disturbing as her previous meditations on sex in the bed. Oh, gosh, she is so wicked. <laughs> she is there, you know, a symbol of debauchery and presumably, you know, sort of more or less saying that she is selling her body for diamonds. And like you say, all of those references that bring in uh, Shakespeare. Oh, she's just so clever. <laughs> And there are so many, th those clever constructions are less quotable, I suppose, than most of the clever things that she's remembered for. She's remembered for these incredible quips. And she does write dialogue very well, actually, because all of the dialogue from the Diamond Lil side of the, the equation tends to be just amazing lines. And one of my favorite ones was page 112, it starts, and she meets Captain Cummings, remarkably named man. <laughs> I don't think that was an accident. Uh, was a Salvation Army preacher who is devastatingly handsome. And she begins to uh, speak to him properly in this scene. 
which is quite an extended scene, actually. He says the most boring things, like that are just like advancing the plot. And she says things like, he says, because he's Salvation Army preacher, you should not speak disrespectfully of God and those who serve him. All I'm interested in is Greek gods, Lil asserted. You know, you kind of look like one yourself. <laughs> It's like, okay. And she just continues in that vein, doesn't she? Very much so. She's a wonderful writer of dialogue. Um, and in a row with her play, the playwright Mark Linder over authorship, authorship of uh, the play Diamond Lil, it's again drawing on the, uh, the Jill Watts biography. Um, the, the accounts of their exchanges are fascinating, that she's really laying aggressive kind of creative control to particularly priding herself in, you know, you didn't write a word of the dialogue, you didn't write the characters. You know, all you all you gave was, you know, locale and atmosphere. And that's all that's been done on teen times. I'm paraphrasing here and that she's very clearly very proud of her ability to write, uh, to, to, to write uh, snappy dialogue. But I think, too, we're also seeing the, the interesting problem of the novel as another form that, you know, so much of both play and film rely on the visuality of Mae West, the construction. So one of the things she's thinking about, uh, she seems to be trying to do with the novel is to think about, you know, how do you replace that immediate kind of visual, uh, vivid iconography with uh, with a kind of a linguistic equivalent? And I think that's where those longer passages, often highly sensuous, often sort of impressionistic moments, and and those really clever sentences that, as you say, aren't really one-liners as such, but kind of w turn around the motion, motions versus emotions and moments like that that keep the uh, keep the reader, as it were, on their toes. Yes, because if this book comes out either at the same time or very shortly after uh, the film, I can't really quite work out how it's published in 1932 and the film is supposed to be 1933. So I'm confused by that. But everyone seems to think that it's after the film. What's interesting about the dialogue is how when I read it, I could hear May, voice, May West's voice in my head, how I could see her visually. Um, and how that the two, the two forms are in such dialogue. It's really the persona that's driving both the text and the film itself. And then they refer back to each other in these interesting and clever ways. Um, although when I was looking for things to read about, I didn't find a lot about the book. Everybody writes about the film. Yes, I think uh, that it's very much, she's very much uh, gone down in, in history in terms of cinematic history. Which is a pity. And one of the things I think is satisfying looking at at least this Virago edition is its positioning in the Virago series that I think allows her allows her a different type of role as a fascinating uh, commentator on uh, on on women's desires and women's sexuality. Yes, absolutely. She is all about the sexuality that she's trying to create. But she doesn't, I mean, she doesn't just talk about sex. That was one of the things that struck me, I suppose, about the book is how much she brings in political narratives. It's set in New York of the 1890s. So she talks a lot about how the bar owner and her protector, Gus Jordan, is implicated in municipal corruption. So she brings in a lot of quite interesting big picture stuff. It's not just a broad in a fancy dress with big tits. Absolutely. In many ways, it was darker, a darker book than I was expecting. And a really quite a vivid, uh, vivid rendering of a particularly a sort of ugly, corrupt, uh, interconnected world in which both crime and politics and money and, and sex and alcohol are all, are all very deeply intertwined. And she also, of course, which really surprised me was her section on white slavery and Chinatown. Now, not that I was surprised that white slavery was part of the narrative because it's, you know, it's a big moral panic of the time and it's a persistent trope that runs through discussions of prostitution and sex work. It was more when she talked about the Chinatown aspect of the trafficking that she was really quite sympathetic to the fact that the businesses in Chinatown are part of this and are blamed for this unjustifiably. I thought that was really quite a tolerant way of presenting those characters. Yes, I think the book's racial politics are really interesting. 
it both draws on and not mostly perpetuates the sort of uh, racial stereotypes of the era, as you say, the Chinaman figure with the dialect um, often seen as the uh, the uh, the, the saffron faced Orientals, for example, phrasing like that. Uh, you and you also, of course, get anti Semitic stereotypes. You get Latin American stereotypes. Um, you get a whole series then of um, of, ra- ra- of, of, ra- of racial uh, stereotypes and uh, racially um, insensitive um, characterizations. And yes, it's the same, which had been unfortunately all too common at the time. And yet there's that interesting moment, as you say, at the beginning of chapter seven, where one of Gus Jordan's, um, uh, one of the people who works with him in, in producing his white slave trade, uh, Charlie Fong, is being positioned, and this is a, presented as a kind of evil scheming, the sort of iconic evil scheming oriental figure of so many uh, early 20th century stereotypes. But it's very much positioned that Chinatown um, and that Im- or, or, uh, and that um, Chinese immigrants are very much positioned as coming into a world in which uh, white socioeconomic supremacy is all, is is dominant, and that who need need then you say to adapt to as as you says. They must submit to the terms of the white man, and that very often they must accept the blame and censure, while the white man took the lion's share of the profit. So rather than a world in which, you know, these these racially other immigrants are engaged in corruption, it's very much a world in which um in which white property owners are deeply vested in and, and profiting most from the mechanisms of that corruption. And most include, including very much the world of politics. They felt the pressure of ward politics. They were forced to contribute generously to campaign chests and election expenses. That's, I think, a very interesting insight into these worlds that often doesn't, uh, isn't always discussed. Yeah, absolutely. And also at later points when she's talking about drug dealing and addiction, there is a very strong hint that the police are corrupt and are ignoring the opportunities to stop serious drug dealing and targeting addicts instead. So I think that throughout she's conscious of, you know, the power dynamics and that the obvious evil seducers or evil drug peddlers are maybe being enabled by the system itself, which is run by perfectly respectable white middle-class men in cahoots with the unrespectable types like Gus Jordan on the streets. And of course, with Gus Jordan, we can see a man who's heading towards respectability politics, who's uh, keen to leave it to uh, to, to avoid get, uh, getting too much dragged down in scandal, which is why the, the, the white slave trade that he's been perfectly happy to uh, to run um, is beginning to come a source of anxiety to him. Not Not moral anxiety, but reputational anxiety. Yeah, moral anxiety. Gus just doesn't do that. In fact, Gus is quite interesting that way because he's represented as quite sentimental. You know, when he meets the uh, the, the the runaway girl Sally, whom he's uh, you know he's quite sort of t- t- genuinely sort of saddened by her story and is quite kind to her, and then basically packs her off to be sent uh, unawares to a brothel in Rio. It's a kind of fascinating glimpse into a kind of easy sentimentality of a certain type of man that's nevertheless not going to let that moment, or, or rather who can afford the pleasure of that easy sentimentality and then perfectly happily and ruthlessly uh, take advantage of the, of, the very, of the very vulnerability that he's been pitying. Yes, and it's, it's people like Gus and also the kind of atmosphere that she creates around the Bowery and his bar. The Bowery is an area in New York City. She has chosen the 1890s as her setting for this story. And that's actually when she's born herself. So she has no memory of this. And what interests me about that choice, I suppose, is that she's using a kind of historical fiction to comment upon crime, sex, drugs, racism. And her persona is very much, it has that old fashioned edge to it. I mean, with the corsets, they're hardly the, you know, in look of the 1920s and 30s. And she creates this amazing controversy in the late 1920s. She's actually brought to court because her dance is considered so lewd. And she does a dance called the shimmy, um, which she performs in court to prove that it's actually not that rude at all. <laughs> um, but in the time when the, when this film and this novel is out, she looks kind of old fashioned. And I feel like she's using these long-established narratives about vice that 
are so popular in the late 19th century and just continues to recycle them and to restage them in order to maybe get away with saying more, maybe by making it look old fashioned, it takes the edge off, makes it less explicit. I mean, what do you think? Do you think it's a very conscious choice? Well, I think so. I think there's a strange combination in her work of a sort of startling frankness about sex, sex and desire, but also a kind of elusive irony that allows her to kind of um, evoke some, as you say, age old concepts of the sort of menacing femme fatale and this, um, this older era that's at the same time is still very much engaged with the, 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 the gender and indeed racial constructions of, of the actual 1920s and 1930s. Um, I thought it was interesting that the uh, I think it's the Variety review of um, of the of the staging of the play comments that seeing Diamond Lil was like going slumming thirty years ago. Very telling. And I thought that was particularly interesting because it suggests, doesn't it, that this is um, that there's a certain cover, a kind of sense of oh well, this may not be the world of the present. And yet, of course, we think about sort of white slavery, which is, of course, a moral panic and a, uh, of, late, of the Victorian period, but is nevertheless becomes a crucial part of early 20th century America's discourses of crime, punishment and purity. You know, the 1910 White Slave Traffic Act, better known as the Mann Act, um, you've Clifford Rose, horrors of the white slave trade, the mighty crusade to protect the purity of our homes. And again, the way in which that discourse is sort of set up. Um, and of course, it's an intrinsically racist discourse, and we see this in the ways in which it's represented in the text. The the agitation around it centers around the intrinsic horror of of the concept of defiled whiteness, of miscegenation. So, so it's very much then um, a concept that uh, and a sort of moral panic fear that's been ongoing, but is never but it nevertheless has taken on a sort of new urgency for her. The, but the eighteen nineties might allow her a side sidestepping. I'm not really talking about this. Uh, I'm not really talking about the present as such. Yes, because she really does cling to a very old fashioned physical appearance and her clothing and nothing she wears looks trendy of, of this time period, you know. And I just think that that is part of as much of her drag act persona and also how she can maybe tease and suggest things without you know, violating the boundaries too, obviously. Although, of course, many people did find her quite explicit at the time. I was reading some, one of the movie magazines, which would give you like two or three lines about what the film was about and mentioned things in relation to She Done Him Wrong, the film, and would say sex talk. And every review concluded with Leave the Children at Home. <laughs> And frankly, they certainly have a point, especially, I think, when it comes to the novel, which has passages of really sort of really relatively explicit descriptions of sex and sexuality and, and desire. But it's also perhaps the sense, and there's still that sense with Mae West that she, that's, uh, and this is, of course, at the heart of that court case and that wonderful performance of the shimmy, the, the sense that it wasn't so much, however, what she said as how she was saying it. And, She's closer to saying, you know, I could say almost anything, do almost anything on a stage if I smiled and was properly ironic in delivering my dialogue. And F. Scott Fitzgerald praises her as, you know, in relation to some of the iconic actresses of her day as the only type with an ironic edge, a comic spark. So there's still in this sense of performance, this sense in which, um, in which Mae West seems to occupy a kind of slight, not a sort of nod and a wink approach to this elaborate performance of intense female sexuality that might allow her to some extent to get away with things. And I think maybe the novel, however, produces um, certain complications for that in that uh, there's actually, as I said, in her, that the substitute for that immediate visuality and her perfor the, the performance of Mae West's voice and look requires a kind of writing in to try and produce some similar effects on her readers. Yes, yeah. I mean, the relationship between the two is, is really quite fascinating. And anyone who, you know, enjoys Mae West should absolutely read the novel and watch the film. And then maybe read the novel again. Because... Here, here. And I would throw in her autobiography uh, while you're at it. <laughs> yes, yes. Just immerse yourself. But before we conclude, we really have to see if we can rate the rudeness that Mae was trying to camouflage with all of her ironic tilts of the head and sultry looks. So censorship bingo time. 
And we start, as usual, with breasts. Well, absolutely. Lots and lots of breasts. Or at least mostly mostly lils, but they make several repeat appearances. <laughs> yes, I mean, Mae West is all about the boobs. Isn't it they called the Life Fests Mae Wests after her tits? The, um, the pilots... In the Battle of Britain, uh, so it's so so it's uh, so it's said, so it's said. Yes, it sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, it's the sort of thing she would have absolutely approved of. <laughs> oh, absolutely, in fact, and, and seems very likely to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> right, so definite tick for that. Uh, bestiality, no, surely not. I don't think so. Though I mean, that, that, there's, so, there's so much implied going on in the uh, in the alleyways of, uh, of of New York, but I don't think I don't think anything directly. We may be missing something. And then sex work. Well, yeah, it's a major plot point. Very much so, and of course, uh, on, on two layers of it as well. There's multiple layers actually. There's kind of the prostitution taking place all around New York. There's the uh, the, the girls being shipped out to the brothels that Gus and Risha are running in Rio. But of course, there's also that central question of what it is, you know, whether or not one sees Lil as engaged in sex work, which he is, of course, in a very, in a, more lit- in a literal sense, and certainly from the point of view of the Irish censor. Yes, and but it's quite clear that she doesn't see herself as a sex worker. You know, it's it's really quite interesting how she wants to stand aside from the stereotype, I suppose, that the audience would have in their mind about sex work. Or perhaps in in some ways, not to impose too many modern perceptions on Mae West, but nevertheless a more modern a more modern conception of how one might see a sex worker, that she certainly sees herself as more engaged in a series of perfectly reasonable transactions, but at the same time she does seem to have some connect seem to retain a sense of connection to the girls, say at the, around the Bowery, and um, and to sort of the sense in many ways that I think she just she, she's been smarter than those reduced to poorly paid prostitution. Yes, yes, absolutely. She is a cut above the rest, smarts wise. That is the most important part of her character. And then the next one is racism. Well, yes, I mean, there is a lot of uh, phrasing that people now would find offensive, which she both, as you said, plays with approvingly, but also interrogates. And of course, you do have the very hot sex with a Latin lover, which of course would be a quite would would be quite enough for the Irish answer anyway. <laughs> yes, and is explicitly framed as you know I, I've been waiting to try one of you Latin lads, and you didn't disappoint. Yes, Juarez is very much uh, living up to or uh, living up or uh, down to all the relevant stereotypes in this <laughs> in this respect. The character that is. <laughs> Yes, so we can tick that, definitely. And then drugs, yes, explicitly talks about hard drugs, addiction, and various forms of dope. So yeah, we could tick that. And then politics. Well, yes, it is at its heart because of the way that she's trying to describe Gus and the municipal politics and all of that. That's it's just a huge part. Also, one of the other characters, Flynn, wants to muscle in on both Gus's respectable line of business and his bar and his woman. So, yes. And while uh, the Irish censors may not have been too upset at sort of uh, at, uh, questionable views of uh, American, American local politics, uh, figures like Dan Flynn might uh, suggest certain things about Irish Americans abroad and that maybe they were not, in fact, leading lives of unexemplary purity or, or of exemplary purity. Oh, yes, absolutely. And actually, in the film, I noticed it was conspicuous how a number of what you would consider really disreputable down and out characters who come to the bar are Irish women coming to buy beer, you know, by the by the jug with extremely strong Irish accents. So, yes, there is a certain amount of commentary about Irish America as well. So we're ticking this. Then swearing. I have to say that I found the dialogue very clean. To my surprise, given some of the topics being being dealt with, but there really is not, I think, even from the gangster figure Chick Clark, a great deal of uh, of direct swearing. Yeah, although he does call her a whore. Would that count? I think we might allow that. We're carefully inspecting our, our, our texts here. Yes, I think we can allow that. Yeah, but I mean, in general, yes, everybody is very clean-mouthed indeed, given they're supposed to be, you know, the underbelly of an urban 
underworld. And then infidelity. Well, I'd say that nobody's really married. <laughs> Such a comfort, yes. <laughs> I feel like it vaguely should be there in the sense, uh, but but I, I, I don't think uh, the question of whether one whether it is shocking to be unfaithful to one's... Uh, one's a protector and diamond buyer by shagging other people off secretly in various uh, rooms is, you know, morally not great. But then uh, from the, again, from the point of view of the Irish shed, so the whole situation is so, is so debauched that uh, I'm not sure infidelity would come into it. I mean, in the sense, the whole plot, of course, is, is about the conception of infidelity, but not about adultery as such. Yes. Yeah. Because Lil starts off with Chick Clark, who gets put in jail, and then she moves on as any sensible person would, but he objects to her moving on. But yeah, nonetheless, I mean, nobody's married, so we'd have to, we might have to skip that one. And then crime. Well, 100%, <laughs> the whole thing. Lots of crime. And as we said, a much, uh, much more detailed and darker, detailed and darker part of the novel than we might have expected than the whole story, in fact. Yeah, I'd love to have seen the stage show as well. You know, having seen two of the three iterations, I feel denied that I haven't seen the stage show. I know, it would be fascinating. And then genitalia. Well, yes, I mean, that is very funny, that curl reference, admittedly. <laughs> yes, genitalia is certainly heavily alluded to, but I'm not sure it ever makes a direct appearance. No, I don't think so, really. I mean, that is the whole point of her act, isn't it? That it's suggestion. Yes, although the text is very frank about uh, the pleasure that Lil gets from sex. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a whole orgasm scene with the Latin lover and everything. It's amazing. And then we have abortion. Well, I didn't see anything, actually. Oh, it's interesting. There's references, of course, to on. on um unexpected and unwanted pregnancy, but I don't think there's much of an implication that one might do something about that as such. Mm. Yeah, I think not. I mean, maybe it's possibly setting it in the 1890s as kind of removing that as a more commonly known option. No, we can't take that. And then orgies. Well, no. <laughs> I think Lil is a, a one man at a time, so she doesn't get confused between the diamonds. True enough, though, of course, that, 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 that there's a delightful sense an orgy might break out. Um, it, incidentally, not to get too excited, but Sally, the, the forlorn uh, waif who gets uh, drawn up into the slave trade, the, uh, into the, uh, into the prostitution, to her trade, uh, has got into trouble initially by sleeping with a married man. I just saw that. So I think we could, if you like, take infidelity, just in case we're running out of things. Oh, yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another one. So we can retrospectively go back and tick that one. But no orgies, alas. And then sexual assault. Well, yes. Yeah, because Lil herself uh, is nearly choked and throttled and then semi-raped by Chick Clark after he gets out of prison. So we can tick that. And then extramarital pregnancy. Yes, because Sally gets into trouble. Yes. Right. So we tick that one. Uh, masturbation. I mean, reclining on the bed, hmm, it wasn't really inferred enough, I think. No, it's, it's quite interesting, as I said, those scenes where she's reclining in bed, pondering, and, 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 the, and the sensuality with which her pleasure in her diamonds is described uh, is very much written as, a, as, a, as in many ways, a very high, it was a highly sensuous sort of pleasure scene. But I, think, I don't think we can directly count that as masturbation. Not enough for bingo purposes. No, sadly not. Well done, Mae West, for evading our scrutiny there. Uh, sex toys. Well, I feel like the diamonds are a very good argument. <laughs> yes. I mean, they are like absolutely crucial to why she thinks the men are hot. You know, indeed. <laughs> she even says about about Flynn, she says, if he had a diamond belly, I wouldn't sleep with him. The, high, the highest or lowest thing she could say about someone. <laughs> Yeah, we can't take that, I'm afraid. And then an interesting one, feminism. What do you think? Of course, whether Mae West and what she came to represent could be described as a feminist icon or not is, of course, itself a whole <laughs> topic of much fascinated debate. Um, I feel myself there isn't, looking at it from the point of view of the Irish censor, uh, feminism in the way we might expect them to see or condemn it. In other words, um, most of the women aren't expressing any any shockingly radical demands for 
on reasonable levels of agency. Um, so in a sense, I think not. But there's certainly the more d the sense of feminism as representing something about disruption and female desire, and um, I think possibly might might well fe it might well feel like there's some questionable feminism going on in the text. I mean, Lil has no desire to be part of the ward politics that occupies the men. She's like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> do what you do, lads. I mean, maybe I think we could take it on the basis of the May West persona being so disruptive and challenging gender norms that the censors are so determined to enforce. I think so. Okay. And then divorce. No. Well, hardly anyone is married, so who can be divorced? Mm -hmm. uh, contraception. I'd say not, since, since, you know, as I said, pregnancy is kind of shrugged off by Lil as the natural effect of Sally having gotten trouble. There doesn't seem to be a sense there's much she could do about it. Lil herself doesn't seem to worry about this, interestingly. Mm. So you'd imagine that there's some precautions being taken. But I can't think of any explicit reference to it. No, I have to say I didn't see anything either. I mean, it is odd how absolutely casual Lil is about sex in the sense of precautions. And, you know, um, but she is in no way stricken with angst at any time about sex. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Okay, so we can't take contraception. Menstruation. I didn't think so. I didn't think it was ever going to get that kind of bodily. No, it's funny for uh, for a, a book and a woman so uh, so associated with the with the presentation of the body. There's a, it's a the actual presentation of the body is far more about elusive elusiveness and and sensuality than about direct physical descriptions. Yes, yeah, and then blasphemy. Well, I mean. Yes, with without a doubt, she is offensive to many ideas of religion and directly slags off the Bible quite often. Yes, um, though she does ta she does announce on um in chapter eleven, page one hundred six, that it just goes to show religion would be more of a success if they'd better looking people selling it. Who the hell can get worked up about going to a heaven where there's a lot of people looking like they were brung up on a dill pickle? Now I ask her. That may not be direct blasphemy, but it is uh, it is ver verging into some dangerous territory. <laughs> yes, and her exchanges with Captain Cummings, you know, she takes on the Bible and she's like, I know what the Bible says about people like me. I'm a scarlet woman. And, you know, she's like, I don't care. <laughs> so, yeah, I think a lot of what she says would be challenging for people of a religious disposition in 1933. And then oral sex. No, really? No, no. There's lots again, lots of lots of references to pleasure and pleasuring, but uh, I don't think it ever gets quite that uh, explicit. No, I don't think so. Yeah, pity. But anyway, and then graphic violence. Well, there is a lot of violence actually. There's a number of people get stabbed. One person gets stabbed. One person gets shot. Lil is attacked by a, her ex-lover. I mean, there's quite a lot going on there. I would think. I think so, yes. And after all, you know, the, the, the book itself uh, begins not with, um, well, it begins about Lil, but uh, it's Chick Clark uh, there, you know, already plotting violence and revenge against her. So, you know, the possibility of violence is right there from the start. Yeah, we can take that one, definitely. And then finally, queer content. Well, Lil herself does comment that Captain Cummings should fancy her because, you know, she's the living embodiment of everything that's attractive. But maybe that he's queer. So there is that direct acknowledgement from Lil straight away that there are men who just don't like women. I think we can count that. Yes. And Mae West's whole <laughs> shtick, really. Indeed, yes. <laughs> so, yes, let me let me count them up. One, two, fourteen. Ah, oh, not bad. Not bad at all. I am so pleased that you know, in 1933, she published a book that managed to rate so high on censorship bingo. I mean, you've got to give her due credit. I was hoping she would come in. I know it's a lot of illusion, you know, but I, I, I still had my hopes high that she would come in with a, a respectable score, a rather an unrespectable score. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, because although there is a lot of illusion, you know, a lot of the plot points are driven by sex work, racism, crime, you know, so she isn't elusive all of the time, I think. That's true enough, which hence, hence a solid score. 
Well done, Mae West. We love you. Did you enjoy the book? Oh, that's interesting. I did. Um, very much, actually. As I said, it was in, in many ways a darker book than I expected. That that the, what one of the things that made it really interesting was that bleak context of as it the so Gus, Gus's so called suicide hall. Um, it did mean that I found I didn't read it with the kind of pure joy joy of uh, with which I read one of probably one of its influences, uh, Anita Liu's Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, whose uh, Laura Lai Lee with her own uh, love with her own love of diamonds must be uh, must 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 also be some influence for Diamond Lil. Um, I didn't get the same sort of absolute uh, enjoyment simply because there were all these quite darker uh, plot plot strands. Um, but I still brought me a considerable amount of pleasure, and I found that the the, the script of darker passages were genuinely really interesting. You know, I thought really well written, very sort of very compelling descriptions. Even as I immensely enjoyed all the gosh, how voluptuous and sashing she is, and here's some more one liners. Yeah. One of the the things I suppose that I really enjoyed was her her kind of two parter one liner that she had with Captain Cummings, where she kind of traps him like a like a you know like she's the snake and he's the rabbit because he's so mesmerized by her beauty, and she says, "Oh, you can be had as he runs away," which <laughs> which is just so brilliantly calculating. And the book ends with her saying, in triumph, I knew you could be had. And it's all the more fascinating because, the you know, this sort of character, the sort of idea of the old seductive woman usually en ends her story in death. And failing that, if she is allowed to survive, she ends it with contrition and uh, being and crushed. And in this case, yes, she's uh, been swept into Cummings's, or no, now revealed as an FBI agent, uh, Cummings's arms. Oh, yeah, it's just so much fun. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, you're right. I think Gentlemen Prefer Blondes is more, is, is easier to enjoy because it doesn't create, it doesn't have these crime, uh, and the white slavery narrative, which is quite upsetting and which I don't think anybody gets rescued from either. That actually puzzled me a bit in terms of the enjoyment to the book because the figure of Sally is very much being set up as the figure whom, whom will bring Lil to a kind of moral redemption, you know, that say, and she's figured as quite forlorn and her parents are sort of anxious about her. And, you know, you expect her to get rescued in the book. And then she rather ruthlessly is basically just packed by the narrative, is packed off to, uh, literally packed off to Rio. And you're kind of left going, hang on a minute, is she not getting rescued? <laughs> It is a it is a perplexing uh, series of choices, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I think I I can accept these compromises. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think people should read it. I agree. Thank you so much, Mern, for joining me to uh, trawl through the wonders of Diamond Lil's jewelry box. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for having me, and uh, keep your diamonds close. Next time, we're turning to civil conflict in 1920s Ireland. Not as many sequins, I'll admit, but it will be absorbing. Till then, keep your hands clean and your minds filthy. <laughs>